Hi, Geobuck. <laughs> this is Lorelai. Hi. And this is Tomo. Um, and we are here to answer some questions about our career paths um, that we have in geosciences. We both work at the Lamont Doherty Earth Observatory, which is in New York. I am a graduate student. And I'm a postdoctoral researcher. I am a paleobotanist, which basically means that I study plants um, on the planet and in specifically I look at how plants um, respond to the environment. And I am a paleoclimatologist and I use different chemical properties of sediment um, to figure out how the climate has changed over the past 20,000 years. I, I did like geography but that was mostly because I liked the teacher a lot. And, but the specific topics that I enjoyed were um, like physical education, um, mostly if they would let me outside, I was very happy. Um, I did really like science when I was in school, um, but I also really liked history um, and sort of like government and social studies. And so I think um, earth science is kind of a cool way to be able co to combine science and history at the same time. So I didn't really know until pretty late when I was at university, um, so I wanted, I thought I wanted to be a doctor. But before I started my first year, I went on a hike with a geology professor um, who told me all about the geology of the place we were hiking and it was really interesting. And so he told me I should take a class in geology, which I did. And then I, it kind of snowballed from there and I thought it was really interesting and I kept studying it. and. As a kid, always very fascinated by dinosaurs, and so I wanted to dig up dinosaurs um, and went to do a geology program to do exactly that. Um, how it evolved from there is more like when I found out what dinosaur digging was effectively like, I got more fascinated by other aspects of geology, which is what I suppose in the end turned out all right. I wanted to be a veterinarian, but that was mostly because my mom's a veterinarian, I think, <laughs> and because I like animals. I, I wanted to be a barber for a while. <laughs> <laughs> but I mean, that was just because I liked our barber. <laughs> yeah, I worked in a lab for a professor, who the professor who taught my intro geology class. Um, and it was a great experience. I mean, you learn a lot about different parts of the field um, that you might not learn in just a normal class. Well, I had lots of different jobs. One of them was being a mailman. <laughs> um, other, uh, you know, I worked on farms and stuff like that. Again, there's an outdoors component that was really important to me. I think you'd be a good mailman. Thanks. I think there is a lot of, there, there's definitely a lot of opportunity to be creative and we do work in teams a lot. Not so much that we have to, but there's a, just here, there's a lot of communication between the different sciences. Like you're bouncing ideas off of each other all the time. And I think one of the things that we are basically doing is telling a story. You know, we have all of this information and all of this data that comes from somewhere. And so we're trying to figure out what the story behind it is. So creativity is actually quite essential in the whole process. Mm -hmm. You have to be able to think of new ideas. Yeah. and interpret things in new ways. Or good ways to illustrate it. Most of your time here gets eaten away by like f discussion groups or meetings or uh, lectures by other people. My day-to-day -day work can be very variable. I can spend an entire day like uh, writing or creating figures, um, drawing essentially, or perhaps I'll be in the lab um, picking away at little rocks and fossil leaves and. Uh, yeah, I guess my experience is pretty similar where, you know, your day could be spent, you could spend eight hours in the lab where you're just focusing on one task and um, you're just working on one thing all by yourself. Or, I mean, like a day like today, I've spent most of my day in uh, meetings, talking to people about research or listening to talks of other people presenting their research. Well, personally, I find most rewarding is like discovering things, mm -hmm. you know, like if when you the, the whole process of going through from like um, sampling, so getting your your the samples that you're going to study to like analyzing them and then to a result can be like a very long um, process. But then once you're at the end of that, um, 
of that process, it's a very rewarding feeling. Um, one example that I can give is that recently I had this leaf that I had basically like found it in a rock, looked very pretty, then I had no idea what it was, um, took little pieces of it and like subjected to have a chemical treatment so that I can see like the anatomical detail of it. And finally it turned out it was a mistletoe. So you know those things that you like hang over your head at Christmas. And it was kind of cool because it like, it's a discovery not only of like a taxonomical thing, but it shows you what the ecosystem was like. There was something there. Mistletoe is a parasite, so it shows you an extra like trophic state of the ecosystem. So that's what I found, find yeah. rewarding. One thing that we it's important to remember is that we do this science for a reason and there's you know a bigger picture to be looking at so i mean both of our both of our fields have applications to climate change um which is obviously really important and it's becoming more and more important every day so it's nice to be able to contribute to that body of knowledge and feel like you're making a bit of a difference the most exciting project i've been involved with was um probably for my master's, which I completed in New Zealand, mm -hmm. I got to go on an expedition to the Auckland Islands, um, which are in the Southern Ocean between New Zealand and Antarctica. Um, so it was really exciting because it's a place that not very many people get to go and we got to be some of the first people in some of these places um, and got to see sort of nature at its most completely unaltered state. Um, in my case, it was also my master's thesis project, which I did for working for the National Park Service in, in the United States, specifically at Petrified Forest National Park in um, northern Arizona. The, the, the plants that I was studying were deposited in a period when there weren't actually that many dinosaurs around. And the theory was that there was some biotic event that caused these, uh, caused the previous animals to sort of go extinct and then the dinosaurs could rise. But no one really knew what that was. So these researchers that I worked together with had a theory that it was because of a, uh, like a meteorite impact that hit the Northern Canadian Shield. They even had a, an impact crater pegged for it, a Manicouagan impact in Ontario. And, um, so they wanted me to find out if there was in their sediments a floral turnover as well as a, the faunal turnover that they saw, which there was. So that was like additional evidence for their um, biotic disturbance, basically. <laughs> there was a, po a politician who brought in snow uh, into the parliament and uh, said to his colleagues, what's up with this climate change? It's, it's freaking cold outside. And he pre that was his argument for saying like, oh, there is no global warming, there is no climate change. So one thing that we do is we try to like look at these things over something that um, that is not generational timescales. You gotta imagine that it's like difficult to perceive climate change simply because we are living within that limited window in which you know, you might have a really cold winter or you might have a really hot summer and it's difficult to see the, the difference. So you go back in time and you look at these changes over a long period, then you can actually have some material for comparison. And that's how a lot of people found out that the magnitude of change that we're seeing in the modern day are not normal. And that's one very important aspect that paleoclimate um, contributes to. What we do also has very local effects. So for example, my, my PhD project, I'm working on um, a climate change record from the Faroe Islands. Um, and for a community like the Faroe Islands, it's really important to know how much climate change is going to affect them specifically, not just the whole world, but the, those islands specifically, because so much of their economy depends on the fisheries and the agriculture and so knowing what's going to happen and if they can expect you know more rain or less rain or warmer temperatures or colder temperatures has a huge impact on how they can plan going forward. Well I think in geology particularly you got to be very aware of the terrain that you're working in. Um, field work is an important component at least in most aspects of geology mm -hmm. and you can you'd be surprised by you know how many 
different terrains there are to do geology in. <laughs> for, for an example, I was doing field work in New Zealand rainforest where it's just mostly very cold and rainy. So I went outside to find the river that um, I was supposed to get water from. But because it was dark and it was raining, I couldn't actually find that river because it was just too disorienting. Like I couldn't rely on my eyes because it was dark. I couldn't rely on my ears because there was water everywhere. <laughs> <laughs> so I was like, okay, I can't find a river. Well, there's a way to solve this. And I just put pots and pans outside. But trust me when I say that just putting pots and pans outside is not enough to actually like fill your water bottle. Mm -hmm. So the end result was that I was like pretty severely dehydrated <laughs> in a rainforest. The, one of the great things about um, earth science and geology is that you get to travel a lot. So for me, I went to University of California and while I was there, one of the biggest parts of learning geology is that you have to go outside and you have to see the rocks and see the mountains and you need to see all these things to really understand them because they're not things that you can learn from a textbook. Um, so we spent a lot of time uh, in all parts of California and Utah and I spent five weeks in Alaska um, and then I got to go to New Zealand and I did five weeks of field camp in New Zealand and then eventually went back and did my masters. I mean everywhere you go a geological process is actively happening basically. <laughs> so you could be looking at a rock but you could also be looking at a river or you know I come from the Netherlands there's barely any rocks there <laughs> but certainly there's a lot of geologists because everyone is very concerned with like for example what do we do with the rising water table. Just a month two months ago I was in uh, New Zealand and before that or after that we, I was at a conference in San Francisco like you get a lot of traveling for conferences mm -hmm. as well and before that British Columbia um, I think that every geologist also has like a wish list of where they would really 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 like to go <laughs> <laughs> so you never really the problem with traveling is that when once you start you can't really stop so your <laughs> list only grows larger to be a scientist and to be an earth scientist i mean really all you need is um a sense of curiosity and questions to ask so it's not about you know if people think it might be about how smart you are but really if you have questions and you want to answer them you can learn what you need to learn and for i think geology you also need a certain a sense of adventure you have to be you know, you have to be okay when things don't go right all the time or you almost, you know, die of dehydration in a rainforest. <laughs> Oops. Yeah. yeah, I would add to that, like, a, a fascination, a certain fascination with, like, the living and evolving world. Sweet. So after you finish your doctorate, you usually have a year or two where you're employed just to do research um, and then after that, I think I would like to be a teacher at a university um, because I think sharing what we know and sharing like the passion for what we do is really important. When you are doing like research, you, you get you get sort of installed with a certain amount of critical analytical thought, that, and, and any employer wants that basically. And so recently, one of our um, colleagues got a job at the government advising people about like um, how to handle the drought in California. And within the earth sciences too there's lots of different jobs in industry. I mean there's the oil industry and the mining industry and water. People trying to find water. Where does it go and where does it come from? How to be more efficient with yeah, water. Yeah, how to be efficient with water and environmental issues um, like remediation. So if you know, there's an oil spill, somebody has to go and figure out how to clean it up. Um, my hobbies and interests, I um, I also, like Tomo, really like the outdoors, so I really like to hike um, and like rock climbing. I like music, I love to go see live music with friends. Um, one thing about science is that it really is so collaborative and you make lots of really good friends because you spend a lot of time with people, so. Um, and people, <laughs> I like to read. That's a good thing. I know. Yeah. I like to read things that aren't science. What? I know, in addition to science. I think I'm sort of along those same lines. Mm -hmm. I, like, I, I, my outdoor sports uh, are my greatest hobbies, like mountain biking or track running when I get the chance. Um, apart from that, yeah, I 
I do like to <laughs> I do like to meet up with my friends <laughs> when I get the chance. <laughs> okay, so thank you for for your attention here. I hope this gave you an idea of what a job in earth sciences can be like. Um, and we enjoyed talking to you. So, and if you have any questions, we love answering questions. So, yeah. Great. See ya. Bye. <laughs>